Welcome to this uh, second uh, panel of Hillsdale College's Constitution Day celebrations. We're very happy to have you here. My name is Brad Watson. I am a professor of politics, uh, and I hold the Philip M. McKenna Chair in American and Western Political Thought at St. Vincent College in the virtuous Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. One thing you need to know about St. Vincent is it is the summer training camp of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the only team in professional sports that counts for anything aside from the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, I'm also a visiting fellow at the uh, Kirby Center here in Washington this uh, academic year where I am teaching uh, a course on U.S. constitutional history in the current semester, U.S. constitutional history to 1865, and then in the spring semester I will teach U.S. constitutional history from 1865 to the uh, end of times. Um, it's perhaps a sad sign of the times that we convene a panel on whether or not the Constitution should be revised, replaced, or restored. The Constitution, of course, is now routinely revised to suit the moment by politicians who simply ignore it or twist its meaning to suit their ambitions, or by members of that council of revision we know as the Supreme Court, who routinely vote to amend the Constitution without the consent of the people even as they shamelessly dissemble by claiming they are merely interpreting it. But the provenance, uh, really, of this contemporary, almost casual revisionism lies in those progressives who lived a century or more ago and who, more honestly than current liberals, in my estimation, called for the outright replacement of the Constitution by an alternative, more centralized, less Republican model that would allow for stronger leadership than the founders would have countenanced in order to move the country in political and moral directions the founders would not have recognized. Those progressives appeared on the scene hard on the heels of the American statesman Abraham Lincoln, who most comprehensively sought to restore the Constitution to the dignity and glory he thought it deserves because of its conformity with natural rights, rights that do not change with time or the dictates of convenience or ambition. Lincoln's call for restoration has been echoed, if only occasionally since his time, by men like Calvin Coolidge and Ronald Reagan, amongst others. On the other hand, on the other hand, one of the facts that thoughtful people must confront is that there are other examples of limited constitutionalism in the world today. These other forms of limited and limiting constitutionalism structure the governments and societies of countries that now rank higher on various indices of economic freedom, for example, than does the United States. So perhaps this question isn't quite as settled as partisans of the American Constitution, uh, as Hillsdale constitutionalists might like. We've assembled a very fine panel to consider just this and more. Uh, to my far right, R.J. Pastrito is graduate dean and professor of politics at Hillsdale, where he teaches political philosophy, American political thought, and American politics. He holds the Charles and Lucia Shipley Chair in the American Constitution. Uh, he's also a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy and has published several books, including Woodrow Wilson and the Roots of Modern Liberalism, and has written widely on progressivism and the administrative uh, state. He earned his Ph.D from the Claremont Graduate University in 1996. The most important thing you need to know about uh, RJ is that I've known him a long time since we were students together, graduate students together. I could tell you stories. <laughs> They're stories that, shall we say, might enhance the reputation of Hillsdale College in some ways at least. Uh, and if you buy me drinks after lunch, I will happily tell you those stories. Um, to my immediate right, Terry Moe is the William Bennett Monroe Professor of Political Science at Stanford University and a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution, that blessed place under the palms with the best climate in the world demonstrated by government test, or so they will tell you, uh, yet he still manages to get work done. He has written extensively on public bureaucracy and the presidency, as well as the theory of political institutions more generally. His most recent book is Relic how our Constitution undermines effective government and why we need a more powerful presidency. He's also written extensively on the politics of American higher education, including recently the comparative politics of education, teachers, unions, and education systems around the world. To my left, Frank Buckley is a foundation professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, where he has taught since 1989. 
Previously, he was visiting Olin Fellow at the University of Chicago Law School, and he's taught at McGill Law School in Montreal and the Sorbonne in Paris. He received his BA from McGill. He did graduate work in law at Harvard, but we won't hold that against him. He's a senior editor at the American Spectator and the author of several books, including The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America, and The Way Back, Restoring the Promise of America. Like me, Frank uh, hails from Canada. I like to tell people I'm a reformed Canadian and a reformed lawyer, now fully Republican in my sensibilities and happily teaching not law, but political philosophy, and in particular, the political philosophy of the American founding. Frank is perhaps an unreformed Canadian and an unreformed lawyer, but we shall see. Uh, RJ. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, it's true, Brad, Brad can tell stories. Uh, one thing he's serious about, he, he actually would like someone to start buying him drinks right after lunch. Uh, thanks to Doug Jeffrey, Matt Spaulding for asking me to speak on this panel. Thanks for all of you uh, for, uh, for coming out. Uh, I have to admit that when I saw uh, the topic and, and the, uh, the personnel lineup for the first panel uh, this morning, I had my doubts uh, as to whether anyone would be interested in this second panel. But here you are, so thank you. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the two themes, uh, I think, are very much connected. So, so this is a, uh, first of all, this is a Hillsdale College event, right? So I'm supposed to be, f I'm for the Constitution. Did I get my, <laughs> I got that right, I hope. Uh, and honestly, I mean, as Brad uh, alluded to in his opening remarks, I think only in the, in the crazy kind of, of election season that, that we've had uh, does it make any sense uh, that we'd actually be having a Hillsdale panel on, on this question, on whether or not we, we uh, want to restore the Constitution. And I, I really do consider it a, a tragedy that this is now a question among conservatives. Uh, and I say tragedy because conservatives during the Obama years, uh, at least until recently, have been, uh, it seems to me, remarkably united uh, on the response to Obama's liberalism. Right? If you think about it, uh, the energy on the right since 2009 uh, has been all about getting back uh, to the limited government constitutionalism of our founders. That, that's where the energy has been. And for a movement that has in the past been quite, uh, I would say, fractured on the question of the American founding, the uh, kind of conservative coming together on this question, uh, to my mind anyways, uh, since 2009 has been the great silver lining of the Obama years. What an opportunity that has been for those of us who hold uh, those principles in highest regard. And likewise, I would say what a tragedy it is if today that window of opportunity is closing. So have we missed the best opportunity we've seen in generations to restore the principles of the founding to their rightful place? And if we have, by the way, I'm, I'm actually much less inclined than some of my friends in the conservative movement uh, to blame Mr. Trump for this uh, than I am the, uh, the arrogance of leaders on our side, uh, who it seems to me, uh, I regret to say, have utterly squandered the historic electoral victories with which the Tea Party empowered them in 2010 and in 2014, and who have utterly failed to understand the nature of the energy that fueled those victories and the precariousness of the opportunity that those victories presented. So we've come to this moment where uh, <clears throat> We've come to this moment where conservatives themselves question the idea of restoring the Constitution. Uh, now, this is a question that I do hear sometimes from my students, I should say. Uh, and I think from them it's quite, it's quite understandable, especially if you understand the students at Hillsdale College. They, uh, they look at the state of government, they look at the state of politics in our time, uh, and they wonder if it isn't proof that the framers of the Constitution did something wrong. Couldn't they have foreseen the big government liberalism of our time? Couldn't they have therefore constructed things more carefully, uh, they want to ask. Uh, haven't the anti-federalist warnings about the power of the national government 
uh, proved true in our time. Now, part of my uh, answer to students asking such questions is to remind them that even the most perfect constitution on its own is, of course, no guarantee of success. And this is something that was well understood by our framers and which uh, we would do well to remind ourselves of today, uh, I think, before we talk too much about revising or replacing. The Federalist Papers is a great source for the explanation and defense of the Constitution. But for all of their enthusiasm in defending uh, the structure and the mechanisms of the Constitution, Madison and Hamilton are very careful in that book to emphasize that these things uh, are only what they call auxiliary precautions. They're, they are mere, uh, mere helps, in other words, for the thing that is even more important in defending the people's liberty. And that is what they call the vigilance of the people, or the people's, quote, vigilant and manly spirit. So the structure of the Constitution, in other words, is there to help protect the people from what are called temporary errors and delusions. Right? That's the phrase that's used. But no Constitution can help a people whose vigilance and spirit has become deeply and even permanently corrupted. So before one asks if a constitution needs to be revised or replaced, one must first determine, it seems to me, if the people themselves are fit for constitutional government. And so have the people been properly vigilant with respect to their liberties? If they haven't, isn't the first order of business to restore a proper understanding of and an attachment to the principles of free government before we entertain notions of revising or restoring a constitution. And so we might start with an understanding of the principal threats to our constitutional government that have been tolerated in our time. In particular, we seem to have tolerated today the replacement of rule by consent of the governed with rule by bureaucracy and rule by courts. Regulatory agencies are only in competition with our courts on the question of who exercises the most influence today on the great public policy questions. Note the major thing that agencies and courts have in common. Neither are elected or accountable in the ways uh, that policymakers are supposed to be in a Republican regime. Yet today, uh, as elections come and go, as new legislatures replace old ones, these have increasingly little actual effect on our public policy. Instead, if you think about many of the major national policy issues today, you'll realize that the majority of them are the result of regulatory action by agencies, not the direct result of laws enacted by our national legislature. So as Congress debates and votes one way, for instance, on immigration policy, or on internet policy. The real policies on these vital issues, and many others, are actually being set by administrative agencies. It's the Department of Justice, for example, that has made the most sweeping policy on immigration recently, doing so not by implementing any change in law, but by changing its own regulations. And it's the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, that right now is setting sweeping new policy on internet regulation. Okay? Your elected representatives in Congress have had nothing to do with this, nor have they had anything to do with the federal government's sweeping new edict that every public school in the country admit anyone to any bathroom they choose, male or female. And that's a major policy, obviously. Uh, it directly affects every public school child in the country, and it came not out of the lawmaking process, where voters have some influence and where, of course, it never could have been enacted, uh, but instead is simply a decree of the Department of Education. Uh, you may recall, going back a little bit, at the end of the Bush presidency, the recent Bush presidency, your elected representatives in Congress debated and voted against the bailout of automakers. Yet the Treasury Department went right ahead and bailed out GM and, Chry and Chrysler quickly thereafter. 
And at the outset of the Obama administration, this was the Democratic Congress debated and voted down cap and trade legislation. And following that, uh, the EPA has been aggressively implementing greenhouse gas regulations as if that vote never happened. The fact is that elections for our political branches of government, the debates that take place there today, matter less and less. Now, elections can and do often change the makeup of Congress and the presidency. But as I said, elections have much less influence over courts and agencies. Uh, for example, I'm sure I don't have to revisit uh, for this audience uh, that the very meaning of the institution of marriage in this country has been redefined by five unelected liberals on the Supreme Court. This is exactly why one scratches one's head to see that the favorite strategy of our enlightened congressional leaders is to run crying to the courts of all places when faced with rule by executive or bureaucratic decree. And they are shocked, shocked, when the courts aren't terribly sympathetic. And by the way, if you think they haven't been very helpful lately, just wait until the President Hillary Clinton gets her chance to appoint a generation of judges to the Supreme Court and to the circuit courts around the country. So before we start thinking about whether we need to revise the Constitution in order to deal with our sad state of affairs, we should bear in mind that our conservative leaders have failed to remedy the situation not because they have stuck with the Constitution, but because they have run away from the Constitution and the clear remedies that it already provides. James Madison, of course, in his explanation of the Constitution's checks and balances, shows how the system is designed to give each branch the best means of defending itself from abuses of power by the other branches. And he even worries that they have over-empowered Congress, since it clearly has the advantages in this system. So what has happened? In Federalist 51, Madison says that each branch must possess two things in order to maintain a constitutional equilibrium. That is, not only the tools necessary to defend themselves, but also the willingness to use those tools when it is necessary. Well, Congress still possesses those tools, but it has not shown the willingness to use them. This has been the case, I think, in two key areas. First, Congress has refused to use its most obvious power, Senator Sessions referred to this last night, the control over the purse, to hold responsible the bureaucratic agencies that can only be funded by congressional appropriations votes. Uh, it is remarkable to me how much Congress allows itself to be pushed around by the bureaucrats whose salaries it pays. And it wasn't too long ago when the situation was much the opposite. Agency administrators used to tremble in fear at the prospect of being hauled before an appropriations committee, chaired by the uh, likes of John Dingell, for example, because they understood that congressional appropriators like Dingell wouldn't hesitate to use the appropriations process to make the bureaucrats show them some respect. Today, by contrast, consider the open and smug contempt with which agency bureaucrats treat the very members of Congress whose votes are needed to fund their agencies. I'm sure many of you saw the arrogant performance of IRS Commissioner Koskinen as he was questioned before the House of Representatives about the targeting of conservative organizations. That is the prevailing attitude now that Congress has made it clear that it will not use the appropriations process to hold bureaucrats accountable. Consider that when CFPB head Richard Cordray was asked in a recent congressional hearing who in his agency was responsible for a spending decision in the hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. Cordray smugly retorted, why does that matter to you? Yeah, if you look that up on YouTube. And why not be smug when Congress will not use the constitutional powers provided to it to do something about it? 
Yet even an elementary read of the Federalist Papers shows that the vesting of the people's elected representatives with the taxing and spending power was among the most important guarantees of popular liberty. Okay, so that's one way that we could use the Constitution that we already have to defend ourselves. Another way is to stop acting as if the Supreme Court gets a monopoly on interpreting the Constitution. This too is utterly contrary to our constitutional design, yet it is accepted as gospel by our enlightened political leadership. You can't have a separation of power system if only one branch gets to say definitively what the Constitution means and thus defines the powers of the other branches. Madison also addressed this directly, this time in the 49th Federalist Paper, explaining as follows, quote, that the several departments being perfectly coordinate, none of them, it is evident, can pretend to an exclusive or superior right of setting the boundaries between their respective powers. And Madison knew that to hold otherwise would mean that you'd have the situation we see today, where major policy decisions are made by five unelected lawyers and the other branches simply throw up their hands as if that's how it's supposed to be. We've let the Supreme Court get away with this, uh, at least since the Cooper v. Aaron decision in the 1950s, partly because our elected representatives find it safer for their jobs to cede tough calls to the courts. A better way to do it, however, might be to follow the example of Abraham Lincoln, thinking specifically of his response to the Dred Scott decision. The court's conclusion in that case which partly was that blacks could not be citizens of the United States. Had to be obeyed, Lincoln said, in that case, with respect to the parties in that case. But that did not mean, he said, that other branches of government and the people themselves had to accept as a general matter the court's interpretation of the Constitution. All branches, of course, not just the judicial branch swear to carry out their duties in accord with the Constitution. Lincoln's Department of State, for example, continued to issue passports to blacks, even though the court said in Dred Scott that they couldn't be citizens. And this was entirely in keeping with the Constitution's separation of powers logic, a logic which we in our time uh, could surely use a refresher on before we get too excited about revising or replacing that which we evidently no longer understand. And if it's the case that we really have become as supine as these examples that I've cited seem to indicate, that we're willing to suffer abuse of our liberties from those whose salaries and budgets we have the power to control, and that we're willing to have our fundamental social institutions upturned by five unelected progressive lawyers then our Constitution is not the problem. We are the problem. And a new or revised Constitution, no matter how clever, isn't going to help us. Uh, so, so count me in favor of restoring what Madison calls the vigilant and manly spirit of the people. Once we do that, uh, I think we will find that the Constitution we already have will be more than adequate. Thank you. Okay, I'm Terry Moe uh, from Stanford. Um, I want to start by thanking Hillsdale College for inviting me to be here. Um, I suspect that the basic argument that I have to make um, is going to sit well with the people at Hillsdale uh, and with most people in the audience. I know that. You know, I'm the odd man out here. Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they invited me anyway. Uh, and I think it's more than just to, like, throw tomatoes at me or whatever people want to do. Well, I, I think it's because they really value intellectual exchange and debate. And I, I really admire that. Uh, 
And uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with you today. So, uh, as you all know, uh, we're up to our necks in the presidential horse race that has basically sucked up all the oxygen in this country for the last year and a half or more. And this is really too bad um, for many reasons, but it's bad because it's a distraction from what ought to be the main event. Uh, the point of the horse race, we forget, and of all politics, really, is to run a government you know, that's capable of dealing effectively with the nation's problems. You know, whether the government is a big government or a small government, and whether it's run by liberal policies or by very conservative policies. Whatever the content or scope of those policies, government should be effective. But effective government is precisely what we don't have. America's greatest challenge, I think, is that it is burdened by a government that just doesn't work very well, and in many ways is, is totally dysfunctional. So why is this so? Why are we burdened by ineffective government? Well, that's the question that William Howell and I address in our book, Relic. Um, and what we argue is that the fundamentals of an answer can be traced back to the Constitution which for all its admirable qualities, and we think they are indeed very admirable, imposes a structure of government that is ill-suited to modern times, at least in certain, key see, in certain key respects, not all respects. Now Congress is right at the center of that structure and right at the center of the dysfunction. As a decision maker, Congress is just inexcusably bad. It's utterly incapable of taking effective action on behalf of the nation. You know, most people point the finger at polarization and they say that if we could just like move toward a, a more moderate brand of politics, then Congress could get back to the good old days when uh, it really did just a fine job of making public policy for the country. But the problem with that is there never were any good old days. The good old days weren't good. With some exceptions, you know, the Voting Rights Act and some others, Congress has never been capable of crafting effective policy responses to the nation's problems. For documentation, you might take a look at Peter Schuck's new book, Why Government So Often Fails. Why Government Fails So Often, I believe that's what it is. Um, which provides an encyclopedia compendium of historical evidence of government failure over the last couple hundred years. It's really quite an extraordinary book, over 400 pages long, filled with information of failure. So polarization ha has made a bad situation worse, but it's not the underlying cause of Congress's core inadequacies, which are baked into the institution's uh, makeup and not of recent vintage. Congress is an ineffective policymaker because it is wired to be that way by the Constitution, whose design ensures that legislators are electorally tied to their districts and to their states, and that they will be highly responsive to the constituencies and special interest groups that get them reelected. So Congress is just not wired to solve national problems in the national interest. It's wired to allow hundreds of parochial legislators to promote their own political welfare through special interest politics. And that's exactly what they do day in and day out, year in and year out. Right? And if you wonder about the bureaucracy, you know, exercising discretion and how that seems to depart from the Constitution, why do they have so much discretion? They get it from Congress. Why is Congress building the bureaucracy as it does? giving the bureaucracy so much discretion, not overseeing them effectively. It all comes down to the same thing. Members of Congress have very distinctive incentives, and those incentives are rooted in their states and their districts and what they need to do to get reelected. And the kinds of things that you can think of that would make government more effective are not what's motivating them. That's the problem. All right, so with 
Congress's pathology is rooted in the Constitution. The ultimate problem, in this case, is the Constitution itself. The founders crafted a government 225 years ago for a simple, isolated, agrarian society of less than four million people, you know, about the size of Los Angeles today. Government was not expected to do much, and they designed a government that couldn't do much, you know, with uh, authority separated across the branches and the government filled with veto points to, uh, that made coherent policy action exceedingly difficult, still do. When government has been able to act, congressional lawmaking has typically led to cobbled together policy concoctions that are crafted as they are on purely political grounds so that disparate legislators with very disparate interests can be attracted into the necessary support coalition. So I get something, you get something, she gets something, they get something. And what we wind up with is some kind of Christmas tree legislation that you know, makes us all happy because we get what we want and all the groups get what they want. But does it actually solve any problems? No. I mean, that's the problem. Because the, the whole political logic of it is to do what we need to do piece by piece to cobble together a support coalition. It's not to do what we needed to do in order to create an intellectually justifiable, coherent, effective whole for addressing the problems that are out there. That's not what Congress is about. That's not what it does. And that's why its outputs are so weak and so ineffective. So look no further than U.S. tax policy, uh, which is not a policy at all. Right? It's a grotesque conglomeration of thousands of special interest favors and loopholes. That's what it is. Or witness the ways in which insurance companies, hospitals, drug companies, and other vested interests profoundly shape Obamacare, as it was being formulated, turning it into something that no one would have designed that way if they wanted a cost-efficient, well-working system. But Congress did that. It wasn't like the Democrats that did that. This is what Congress does to everything. It happened to be the Democrats this time. So this approach to governance may have been fine for the late 1700s when there wasn't much to do, but that era is long gone and it's not coming back. Within 100 years, the nation grew to 15 times its original size and population. It spread all the way to the Pacific Ocean and it was developing explosively into a modern industrial society, generating countless problems along the way, from rapacious monopoly to uh, child labor to unregulated drugs to filthy meat processing, you know, to transportation systems that needed to be built, to the great need for sound money, some way to achieve it, and on and on and on and on and on, all these problems. Well. The founders had never anticipated all of this. They didn't know what modern government was going to look like. They didn't know what industrialized society was going to look like. They didn't know about all these problems, that they would need a government to solve those problems because they lived 100 years earlier in a very, very, very different society. So by 1900 or so, the government that they had designed for their society was already way out of sync with the society it was now supposed to be governing. So this is really what the progressive movement was about in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. You know, it was not just a bunch of liberals seeking big government, you know. Uh, what it was, was a bunch of reformers who were sick and tired of inept, corrupt government run by party hacks that couldn't do anything, couldn't solve any problems. And they tried to bring about reforms like a stronger presidency, Teddy Roosevelt, and a merit-based bureaucracy, much as you might joke about it, it was a hell of a lot better than the spoil system that it replaced. In order to better equip the government to perform effectively and actually get something done, that, you know, basic things that people just wanted done, it wasn't about big government, it was just about having a government that could do something and then do it, you know, decently. 
You know, they didn't have that because the government the founders had created was, was not working at that time. This was a brand new time. But while these reforms surely helped, the disjunction between government and society only got worse over time because society just kept changing. So during the last century, the pace of social change has been frenzied, right, driven by stunning technological innovations and an increasingly complex and globalized economy, giving rise to a mind-boggling array of vexing problems that weigh upon Americans today, terrorism, persistent poverty, inequality, a crumbling infrastructure, intense international competition, a broken immigration system, weak economic growth, and more, lots more. What we need is a government that is up to the challenges thrust upon it by the modern world, whether it deals with these challenges in a liberal way or a conservative way, it's deal with them somehow. But what we have is a government designed in the late 1700s, when, when there was no sense that government needed to do these things. It was designed for a primitive world, nothing like our own. So what can we do? Well, the US is clearly not going to shift to a parliamentary system. Uh, that's off the table. And other radical changes are off the table, too, I would say. Uh, but as William Howell and I see it, a practical strategy is to seek out small constitutional changes that promise big payoffs for effective government. Here, specifically, is an approach that we think makes good sense. With Congress the prime source of dysfunction in this system, Congress should be moved to the periphery of the lawmaking process, whereas pathologies can do less damage. And presidents should be moved to the center where they can do the most good. No standing ovation? <laughs> this was it. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> but let me explain. See, with the explanation, everything will be OK. OK, why presidents? Well, they're wiring is very different from Congress's and actually propels them to be, relatively speaking, the champions of effective government. This is so regardless of whether they're liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, seekers of big government or seekers of small government. Quite unlike most legislators, presidents think in national terms about national problems and their overriding concern for their historical legacies drives them to seek durable solutions over the long haul to pressing national problems, which members of Congress just don't do. Needless to say, they're not always right. They're not always successful. And conservative presidents would seek very different policy solutions from liberal presidents. Good. Uh, but all presidents aspire to be the nation's problem solver in chief. And if policymaking power can be shifted partly, not wholly, just partly, in their direction and away from Congress, which is a basic disaster, the prospects for effective government will be much improved. A simple way to do this is through a constitutional amendment <coughs> that grants presidents universal fast-track authority. The nation has 40 years of positive experience with fast-track authority in international trade. And that same model would simply be applied to all legislation. Presidents would craft policy proposals, which are likely to be far more coherent, well-integrated, and effective than anything Congress could come up with. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Take a look at congressional legislation sometime. And Congress would be required to vote up or down, can vote no, on those proposals within a specified period of time and on a majoritarian basis without changing them. No delays, no filibusters, no earmarks, no loopholes for special interests, none of the things that Congress loves. On the other hand, Congress would retain the authority, as it has now, to pass laws on its own if it wants. 
and presidents would retain the authority to veto them. So, even if a president favored policies that you or I considered very troubling or extreme, fast track would hardly make that president a dictator. So let's just evaluate it for a minute. Both houses of Congress would still need to give their separate consent, both the House and the Senate, before any proposal would become law. Policy would be a three-way decision, not a presidential decision. And the court system and the separation of powers system would remain intact along with the Bill of Rights. Everything's the same. We're just changing the decision model about how legislation gets made. The entire constellation of checks and balances would continue to limit what presidents could do, much as it has for more than 200 years. Another fear, perhaps, is that fast track would give rise to presidential overreach. Right? We've heard a lot about that at this conference. Yes. Yet fast track only deals with legislation. Right? It adds nothing to the president's unilateral powers, which are what overreach is all about. Indeed, a big reason presidents have favored executive orders and other unilateral actions is that with Congress such a disaster, the legislative process is all but unavailable for solving problems. Under fast track, presidents would use legislation more <clears throat> and unilateral action less. <clears throat> so, consider immigration, for example. President Bush submitted immigration reforms to Congress in 2005 and 2006. Obama did the same in 2013. All of these bills had bipartisan majority support in Congress, both the House and the Senate. Yet, the first two went down on Senate filibusters, and the third went down when John Boehner refused to bring it up for a vote in the House. The result, no immigration reform and a festering immigration problem that continues to today. And a 2014 executive order by Obama that has caused much, much consternation on the right. right. With fast track, the nation would have passed a bipartisan reform bill more than 10 years ago, and there would have been no Obama executive order. I'm almost done. Finally, what about all the other presidential systems in the world whose experiences, some say, tend to give rise to authoritarian rule? By giving presidents more power through fast track, aren't we risking authoritarianism here? No, we're not. In the first place, we've had a presidential system for 225 years, and we still don't have authoritarianism unless you really twist the definition of that. So what's happening over there is not happening over here. Second, fast track is heavily constrained by all the sorts of checks and balances, as I said, and is hardly the sort of reform that's going to produce a dictator. And third, Virtually every other presidential system in the world is either in Latin America or Africa, and then there's the Philippines. All these countries are less developed by far than we are. Uh, many of them are extremely poor, and they have political systems that are mired in uh, corruption, in spoils, in nepotism, in uh, clientelism. They look like a very, 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 very early of Ameri a version of American politics, and we had all those problems in spades. Right? So, okay, so they, they have these very serious problems of political culture. It's not at all surprising that those systems are threatened by authoritarianism, but those systems are extremely different from ours, where a post-industrial society, we have a very different political culture, and I don't think there's anything to fear that we're going to follow the same path as some Latin American country. We're not. All right, so bottom line. Here in the United States, the most fundamental challenge that we face is that our government is profoundly ineffective at addressing the many serious problems of modern times. We can't blame the founders for the bind that we're in today. They had no idea what a modern society would look like. They designed a government for a tiny agrarian nation, and they assumed that as society changed, future generations would change the Constitution to meet evolving needs. But future generations just didn't do that. Instead, they put it on a pedestal to be worshipped. The Constitution is, in fact, 
among the greatest achievements in the history of human governance. We have much to value and much to be proud of. But what we need now is a healthier, more objective understanding of how the Constitution actually affects our lives today and our ability to govern ourselves and face up to and solve the problems that actually face us. So, modern America bears almost no resemblance to the America of the late 1700s, and it's up to us as the founders well recognized to modify the Constitution to allow for effective government in our own times. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. For the uh, record, I did request that Hillsdale provide me a large hook or the control to a trap door. They did not, so don't blame me. We'll see if I need them again. Howdy. I'm Frank Buckley. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank all the Hillsdale people, all of you people, for having me. There are few institutions I can think of that have more honorably defended the best of America and the Constitution, as, as you have. So it's, it's a great honor. Uh, <clears throat> although I, I confess, when Brad here described <clears throat> me, excuse me, a Hillary Clinton moment here. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm going to power through. Okay. Uh, when Brad here described me as more or less an unreconstructed Canadian, I thought, okay, now the mudslinging begins. <laughs> but in fact, uh, two years back, whilst I was still a Canadian, I wrote a book about the American Constitution called The Once and Future King, in which I said we were moving towards a different kind of constitution, one of an all-powerful president. Uh, that was, the book came out on April 6th of 2014, and nine days later, Nine days later, I became an American citizen. That's right, tax day. <laughs> they said, welcome to America, here's the bill. <laughs> right? And of course, I had you know, the same impulse that every new immigrant has when you become a citizen. I thought, what are we going to do about all these damn foreigners? You know, <laughs> time to roll up the ladder. But, uh, but indeed, I, I did see a problem with not with the Constitution, perhaps, so much as what has become of American government and our move towards strong presidentialism. Uh, and I, I think I probably will agree with everything Terry said just now except his conclusion. But apart from that, it was absolutely right. He's totally spawned on. Because right now, what we have is a president who can make and unmake laws um, without the consent of Congress. He can spend trillions of government dollars on his own, and he can take us to war without the consent of Congress. And the separation of powers, which many think the cornerstone of the Constitution, no longer seems to bind him. He is rex quondam, rex futurist, the once and future king, and I said in the book that all of this is irrevocable. Well, when you write a book, you don't want to make things sound too good, do you? Um, and. You know, I kind of hoped, I'd ho sort of hoped that this would resonate with the political theorists around. Um, I meant to be provocative. I didn't get much of a response. What I hadn't realized is the foundational, you know, principle of, of political theory comes from the big Lebowski, you know. Yeah, well, you know, that's just your opinion, man, right? <laughs> but it wasn't just an opinion because I'd, I'd done all the kind of bells and whistles, the regression analysis, which we, we love doing at George Mason. I, I examined 89 presidential regimes and 50 parliamentary ones over a 39-year period to see how they ranked on Freedom House's measure of economic, of political freedom. And I had uh, 20 dependent variables. I, I did stuff like, you know, you, you get a Latin American variable to pick up what's special about Latin America. Uh, I had, you know, I had about 100,000 observations, and I used, uh, you know, all the most sophisticated devices that I could teach myself to do with STATA, uh, panel corrected standard errors model. And what I found, any, any, any way I crunched the numbers was presidential governments were bad for liberty. Okay, I mean, there, there was just, you know, no way of slicing that so it came out different. And it was the same conclusion that a lady called Pippa Norris at Harvard came to with a, a slightly di somewhat different data set. Um, and you know, for all the theorists, it meant nothing. But I, I'll say this for them. 
They had 200 years of history on their side where things worked pretty well, and I couldn't dismiss that, right? I mean, I thought I had shown that presidential governments per se are, are, are bad for liberty, but America, I had to concede, had been free throughout its history. My point, however, was that it was free because it was American. That is, it wasn't free because of its constitution. It was free not because of the constitution, but in spite of the constitution. And if, therefore, you, it seemed to me, you wanted to study American political freedom, you should look for it in departments of history, or perhaps departments of literature, certainly departments of religion, but not constitutional law, right? And it seemed moreover to me that we were following other third world countries in the direction of an all-powerful president, right? Some of you, I think, had that uh, instinct or that sense when Terry spoke a moment ago and someone said, we're there already, right? Uh, I participated in focus groups where mostly, well, it was a Washington crowd, so they were all lawyers and they were all liberals, right? Um, you know, and, and, and we were talking about executive authority and, uh, you know, these were all people who would have thought it was Peachy King back a couple of years back, but this was last spring, and they were thinking about President Trump, and they thought, we're going to have to think about this one, right? Because what's happened here is power throughout the country has been drawn from the states to Washington and within Washington from Congress to the White House, right? It's, 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 it's the grim logic of power. I mean, power tends to centralize in one person or one body. I mean, that's the history of Britain, for example, right? I mean, when the framers were looking at constitutions, they really had only one model they were looking at. Seriously, that was Britain and Britain's Pittite constitution, the constitution of Billy Pitt, right? Where you had a House of Lords that meant something, you had a House of Commons that meant something, and you had a king that meant something, right? Um, you know, and, and, and in fact, Pitt resigned when the king refused to agree to Catholic emancipation. Right? And, and Pitt thought, well, I, you know, I'm stymied, I can't do anything. Um, clearly, I have to resign. All right? So George III did have that kind of power. There was a separation of powers. But then fast forward from that time to 50 years thereafter and the Great Reform Act of 1832, and what have you got? You've got an all-powerful House of Commons and the Lords is nothing, and the King is nothing, and that's where we are now, right? So um, that, of course, would, would respond to all of the problems Terry had with, with Congress. Um, the only problem, of course, is that it's politically impossible to imagine that kind of constitutional reform, indeed any constitutional reform. That's why I don't pay a heck of a lot of attention to lawyers who come up with this amendment or that amendment. I forget about it, right? I've, you know, I've got better things to do. I mean, spider solitaire makes more sense than, you know, reading those law review articles. Um, so as I say, the, the, the grim logic of power is meant in parliamentary countries that all parliamentary countries tend to become constitutional monarchies, right? and all presidential regimes with about one or two exceptions tend to become countries with an all-powerful president. By the way, do you know what the other exception is? This is a trivia question, right? So America has preserved its freedom in spite of the fact that it is a presidential form of government. Do you know what the other one was? I mean, nobody gets it. It's Uruguay. Right? Go figure, right? I mean, they should, you know, they should almost be Anglophone, right? I mean, they've got it so good. Um, I mean, that's the history of every unhappy country, pretty much, to which America has exported its constitution. And the thing is, you see, that a, a permanent equipoise of power between the branches of the kind imagined by the framers is as unnatural as the deacon's one hoss shay in the poem of Oliver, Wend Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. I don't, you guys know that poem? Do you have to read it, you know, in detention or whatever? <laughs> You know, that's where I learned it, right? I mean, but, but you know, incidentally, you know, not, nobody under 40 knows this stuff. You know, none of them know about the one Hoshe. You know, none of them know about the man without a country. I mean, you know, all, all this stuff that we kind of grew up with, it's gone. Anyway, you know, so have you heard of the wonderful one Hoshe that was built in such a logical way? It lasted 100 years to the day. That's Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., the autocrat of the breakfast table, 
talking about what the Constitution looks like in 1858, where the whole country is going to hell around them. And what he says is, you know, it, I mean, it's a satire on American, the American Constitution. What he says is, you know, the deacon has figured out why chaise, that is, carriages break down. They always break down because one part is weaker than the rest. Okay? And so what the deacon says is, I'm going to bake one shade that's going to go on forever, right? And the trick is make every part as strong as the rest, so no part wears out first, right? That's the beauty of it. I mean, Madison couldn't have done it better, right? And that's the reason, beyond a doubt, a shade breaks down but doesn't wear out. And so he made every part as strong as the rest, and, and it just worked fine. You know, the carriage just went on forever, you know, War of 1812, 1840s. You know, and then a hundred years to the day, the new deacon is driving down with the shea, and all of a sudden he finds himself sitting on a pile of sawdust because everything broke down at the same time, right? You see, of course, if you're not a dunce, how it went to pieces all at once, all at once and nothing first, just as bubbles do when they burst. End of the wonderful one ha shea. Logic is logic, that's all I'll say. Right, so much for logical theories of government, right? I'm, I'm kind of an empiricist. I like to see what things work. And I have to admit the American conservative, the American Constitution has worked wonderfully for 200 years. But now we're permitted to ask ourselves in the age of Obama, like, you know, where exactly are we heading, right? And, and, and why power tends to concentrate in the presidency is all too easy to understand. Um, <coughs> a point in efficiently recognized, I think, is that he is the country's head of state, right? The sinusure of uh, admiring eyes, the subject of a thousand op-eds by Peggy Noonan, right? I mean, if there's something bad that happens, you need a healing speech by the president, give me a break, right? The president cannot be, as he should be, a figure of fun, Right? You're not permitted to laugh at these guys. These are buffoons, for God's sakes. Why would you ever revere a politician? These are the lowest worms that God ever permitted to walk on the face of the earth. That's the only, that attitude is protective of liberty, but Peggy Noonan ain't. The president is also the only person elected by the country as a whole. He is one, the Congress is many, right? He's opposed by the Speaker of the House from someplace in Wisconsin or Ohio you never heard of. It's no contest. He also has, this is Terry's point, way better incentives. He is the Patriot King. He is Bolingbroke's Patriot King. He is George III, right? George III's mother said, George, be a king, right? And that's how we got the American Revolution, right? He was determined to rule, all right? And, you know, the idea was, as opposed to all those, you know, corrupt politicians in the age of Walpole, he would stand instead for the country as the whole. And that's kind of what Terry is saying, right? Let's have somebody who tries to govern for the whole country. Well, he does have those better incentives. I mean, I, I guess I'll concede, yes, it beats Robert Byrd, okay? No question about that. He also has control of the information about the country. He can sit on a scandal until it disappears. And gridlock favors politicians. I mean, that's, that's kind of a hidden story behind Terry here, but it's, it's, it's really the case. Every time a president signs a bill, he loses a little bit of executive power. He, therefore, has the incentive never to do so, because if he doesn't do so, he can say, they didn't act, but I've got a pen, right? All his incentives are not to do deals. That's, that's why Obama's touchiness about dealing with people makes perfect sense if the whole point is to maximize executive power. Well, so the interesting question here, for me at least, is not, you know, um, why have we not followed other presidential countries down the cheerless path of an all-powerful executive because we're not quite there yet. It's, it's why we took so long to get to Obama that's curious. Of course, the never too much to be praised George Mason, right? I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm from Mason, saw it all coming, right? It just took 200 years to get there, right? Which is proof of exactly how prescient he was. You know, he just could see it all coming. So what has happened? I mean, we've had a good run, but what's happened to the country we left behind? 
That was a country with Pascal's God-shaped hole in our hearts, but in our modern secular and celebrity-driven culture, it's not a God-filled hole, it's an Obama-filled hole, right? That was a country where people thought that their children and where people had reason to think their children would do better than they would. That was a country where politicians were trusted. That was a country held together by a common adherence to the public good with generally accepted liberal principles. That was a country that taught its people to love and honor America and not to despise it. And that was a country that could cut deals. And as deal making was baked into the Constitution, they could make it work because in the end, they were all united with a common love of America, but that's not today's country. Was I right to say all this is irreversible? How am I doing on time? Another minute or two if you can wrap it up. Oh, hell no. That ain't going to happen. I see three possibilities, right? I'll give them names. One is James I, right? James I ruled without parliament for about nine years, between 1611 and 1620, but for a two-year parliament. So a president who doesn't need Congress at all. The other possibility I'll call Wayne Gretzky, who holds the record for hat tricks in the NHL. And a hat trick here means you get control of the presidency, the House, and the Senate. And when the Dems do that, it's then legislation on overdrive. And of course, when the Republicans do it, nothing happens. And the third possibility I'll, I'll call Sam Slick from, from Thomas Chandler Halliburton's satire of the 19th century, the Yankee peddler who cuts deals, the salesman. Right, the guy who can reach across to the other side of the aisle like Ronald Reagan did with Tip O'Neill or, or Dan Rostenkowski. And where does that leave us today in the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? Uh, Pascal, again, said, you must make a choice. He said that to the free thinker. Uh, the free thinker said, uh, no, I don't have to make a choice. Pascal said, then you have already made your choice. And of your choices, Hillary seems to me to be James the first. Right? I'm not going to pursue that since I'm pretty much out of time. But um, what about Trump? Right? Some conservatives say he'd be just as imperious as, as Hillary. But he's gone out of his way to deny it. He's written some pretty good speeches, hasn't he? Or at least I don't entirely disbelieve I see him as Sam Slick. I see him as a deal maker. I see him as a guy who cuts deals, and that's been his life, a guy who wrote the book on the subject. And if, you know, Republicans get all three branches, he might even be Wayne Gretzky. So you have to choose between the certainty of one person rule and the possibility of constitutional rule on the other. And we know how Pascal would wager. And those are our choices. Those are our only choices. Some people say we deserve better. That gives rise to a question about what we desert, what do we deserve. Albert Camus wrote about our just desserts. In L'Etranger, his Mirceau, when it, the book appeared, seemed a man devoid of empathy, of affect, a murderer. And then 13 years later, an American edition appeared, a translation. Camus wrote the introduction. He said, Mirceau is the only Christ that you deserve. And some people thought, well, he's denigrating religion. But then Camus immediately denied that. No, he was making a comment not about Christ, but about us. He said, we don't deserve better. And that is why I say Donald Trump is the only Christ that we deserve. But you don't leave it there. Because the son of Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. talked about choices. And he said, as life is action and passion, it is necessary to take part in the action and passion of the day, lest you be thought not to have lived. And so I've made my choice. Thank you. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. I'd ask that you state your question very uh, quickly. I'm told by my handlers we have to finish up in a few minutes. Sorry about that. That's fine. Uh, 
Um, so Dr. Mo, you said um, your idea of fast track uh, would be the president would propose legislation and then Congress would have to either approve it or veto it. Mm -hmm. So essentially the roles of the president and the Congress are reversed in that situation. Um, is that how you would describe it? Would it work basically like that? Uh, it would be a hybrid, basically. Uh, the, the president would have the right to craft proposals, and they would have incentives to craft proposals that are well integrated, intellectually justifiable holes that attack social problems that presidency is particularly important. And the real key to it is that they can put that on Congress's agenda, and Congress can't do what it always does. It can't reach in and start taking out things that they don't like and putting in all sorts of special interest provisions and basically gutting the thing, which is happens, all, happens all the time. So under fast track, they have to vote on this proposal. Now, presidents aren't going to design those proposals without an eye to Congress. They're going to try to design them in such a way that they're coherent, but also that they can attract majorities. And that's what was done. Uh, in the immigration case, right? So then Congress w would get a chance to vote in the Senate and in the House, and only if both the Senate and the House pass it, right, on majoritarian grounds, will it become the law, right? So that's the fast track uh, uh, way of passing laws, uh, but Congress can go ahead and pass laws on its own in any way it wants, just like it does now, right? So that's not done away with, right? We're just adding a new component that allows policy making to be streamlined and gives the champion of effective government a chance right, to craft policies that Congress can't fool with. And to the extent that these policies uh, become the focus of legislative attention and pass, I think the country will get much more effective policies down the road. May I, May I uh, add something to that? So um, I want to say to uh, Professor Mo, I think, I think he should be happier about the situation we have today than, than he is, uh, because I, I think the situation we have is some version of, of the change that he, that he proposes. That, that is to say, uh, with the situation that we have, if you think about it, where, where you, have, you have discretion for administrative agencies, they make regulations, uh, and then it's very, very difficult for Congress to undo those, re undo those regulations. Uh, in fact, by the way, I, I'm, I'm here with my 16-year-old uh, this week, and we went into both the House and Senate galleries yesterday, and in, 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 on both sides, uh, in both chambers, the legislation that was being discussed were, were attempts, which are going to be utterly fruitless, I can assure you, to try to rein in a particular administrative agency. Um, so the, the point is the, the situation we have today is, in fact, you, you, you do have rule by, by presidential uh, initiative. Uh, the president or the agencies under his uh, control uh, make laws, we call them regulations, uh, and then Congress, only if uh, it is able to pass a law of its own, uh, in, in, you know, in contrast, only if it's able to pass the House, pass the Senate, overcome filibuster, then itself be presented to the president and enacted into law, that's the only way in which uh, Congress can actually uh, do, do anything about it. So in fact, I think you should be happier because I think we already, we already do have some version of the, of the system that you're calling for. Yeah, I would say we have much smaller versions okay. of it uh, because really the, the types of regulations that you're talking about are issued under delegation that exists within much bigger uh, pieces of legislation and, and what we're talking about in the fast track process most of the time are those big pieces of legislation that normally don't go anywhere in Congress and turn out to be train wrecks if they, if they ever do pass, right? And so what we want is a process within Congress where really important pieces of legislation that really do address national problems can actually be put together in a coherent way that makes sense intellectually and can be passed. Yes. Thank you for giving us the lecture. You are standing in front of the Hillsdale College. Could you, university, or all of the university, take example from Hillsdale College and bring conservative speaker to the universities? As you were invited over here, because the brainwash on all of the universities across the country, they do not teach 
independent thinking, because if you are independent, you'll be out of university, we have enough free speech. I wonder if there any university you can persuade them. For example, I can come and speak about conservatives, as you come over here and you speak your mind. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I should just make one comment, uh, since uh, <clears throat> to my knowledge this is not some sort of conspiracy, you know, to keep ideas out of universities. I think what, what there are plenty of people uh, on campus, uh, that, you know, there are conservative organizations at Stanford, for instance, um, who would be interested in bringing in speakers uh, to talk on these kinds of topics. Uh, and if somebody here wanted to contact them, I'm, I'm sure something could be arranged. Whether anybody would show up is another question, right? Yeah, uh, well, because probably, I don't know what the statistics are, but probably nine-tenths of the people on campus are liberals, right? I didn't do this, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm just describing the situation, right? Yeah, but you're the guy we have right here. Yeah, right. Right, so, so this is just the, the lay of the land, right? And it's not something I'm happy about. I wish, I wish campuses were much more diverse than they are, but this is the reality. And one way of making incursions, which I would favor, is to go ahead and do it. Get these organizations to bring people in and advertise them and try to stir up some activity, maybe have some debates. But then I count on you. <laughs> um, let me... And <laughs> You know, this is, that's usually not my thing. My, my thing is to sit in my office for eight hours with the door closed. You can, you, you can count on me. I'll take care of that. Um, uh, let me uh, tell you where lunch is going to be, which is in the Grand Ballroom just around the corner where dinner was. Let me uh, encourage uh, all of you to continue this conversation over lunch. Unfortunately, we're uh, butting up against lunch, I'm told, so we have to uh, uh, end it here. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.